All right. Welcome, everyone. I am Kelsey Atwood, Tour and Public Program Manager of the American Revolution Institute of the Society of the Cincinnati. And I'm delighted to welcome you to this virtual author's talk from the original library at Anderson House in Washington, DC. The Society of the Cincinnati is the nation's oldest private patriotic organization. George Washington and the officers of the Continental Army founded the society at the end of the Revolutionary War to perpetuate the ideals and memory of the American Revolution. The American Revolution Institute of the Society of the Cincinnati carries out its public mission to promote knowledge and appreciation of the achievement of American independence by supporting advanced study, exhibitions and public programs, preservation and providing resources to classrooms. In January, 1785, a young African-American woman named Elizabeth was put on board the Lucretia in New York Harbor bound for Charleston, where she would be sold to her fifth master in just 22 years. Leaving behind a small child she had little hope of ever seeing again, Elizabeth was faced with the stark reality of being sold south to a life quite different from any she had known before. She had no idea that Robert Townsend, a son of the family she was enslaved by, would locate her, safeguard her child, and return her to New York, nor how her story would help turn one of America's first spies into an abolitionist. Against the backdrop of revolution and interacting with many well-remembered patriots, the authors of our talk this evening have explored the story of Elizabeth, an enslaved woman who experienced the revolution and made her mark on the Townsend family and a young America. And this evening, we have the pleasure of hearing from our authors, Claire Bellergeau and Tiffany Yucky Brooks. Hello. Um, Hi, everyone. Claire Bellergeau is a historian and director of education at the Ryman Hall Museum in Oyster Bay, New York, and has been researching the Townsend family and their slaves for over 16 years. In 2005, she curated the exhibition on the Townsend Slave Bible. And in 2015, during a visit to the New York Historical Society, she discovered what, be, what may be one of the earliest poems ever written by Juniper Harmon, America's first published African-American writer. She has spoken internationally and published several articles in scholarly journals about the life and artifacts of colonial New York. She lives in, uh, she lives with her husband, Chris, in New York City, New York. And Tiffany Yaki Brooks holds a PhD in American and Dramatic Literature from Florida State University and a Master's of Arts in Classical Literature from the University of Bristol. She has served as a leading or contributing writer to more than two dozen books, including eight New York Times bestsellers. Tiffany has spoken and published widely on early portrayals of race in the transatlantic performance, and as well as emerging American identity in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Please join me in welcoming our authors, Claire and Tiffany. Thank you, Kelsey. Thank you for having us. Yeah, welcome. Excited to hear about the book, Espionage and Enslavement in the Revolution. Yes, we're so excited to be here today, uh, especially with this audience of people that are so passionate about the Revolutionary War. Uh, so if you want me to, I'll get started right away. Yeah, please do. Excellent. Um, so I'm going to just uh, share my slides and we'll get started and you can um, go right ahead and put questions in the chat as I go along and then we'll get to them at the end. So I'm really excited to be here today to tell you this story that I've been working on for 16 years, uh, the story of a woman named Elizabeth or Liz. And so uh, to really talk to her, to talk to you about her story, I want to go to the very beginning of her life. Uh, Elizabeth was born about 1763, enslaved at the Townsend's household in Oyster Bay, New York. And that house has now become a museum called Raynham Hall Museum. The world that she was born into had legal slavery in every one of the 13 colonies and runaway slave ads and for sale ads appeared in every paper. By 1770, 
in New York, the colony she was born into, there was more slavery than any colony north of Maryland. In fact, by the time she was seven years old, if you added up all the New England colonies combined, New York had many more slaves. Even Pennsylvania of a similar size had many fewer slaves than New York. And if you look down at the very bottom of the map at Georgia, in 1770, New York had more slavery than Georgia. Now, decades before she was born, there was a New York law that every town must have a town appointed slave whipper. Our town, Oyster Bay, had a paid Negro whipper, which I found evidence of in our town record books. We even had a slave whipper in 1714, many years before that law mandated it. I found in our archives a blacksmith's book that showed a person paying that blacksmith to put a band and a bolt on a black and attach three wearing irons and one ring. This was an 1802 record. The same blacksmith's book showed someone paying him to strap a black for a welt to a wagon tire. This is literally a medieval torture called breaking on the wheel. There was an extra charge for the 12 nails it took to put it on. So this was actually an 1808 record of this horrible torture that was done right in the public square of Oyster Bay, New York on Long Island. Runaway slave ads like this one appeared in every edition of New York newspapers. I chose this one to show to you because this one's about a person who was escaping slavery from Oyster Bay. And it describes him very carefully that his name's Isaac, gives you his height, five feet, 10 inches high. He's middle-aged. And it even says that he's been passing himself as free, giving himself a last name of Isaac Johnston and describes him as very ragged. And of course, gives a reward if you would get him back to his master. Now, Robert Townsend was also born into the same time. He was born in 1753, but he was born into a very wealthy family of shipping merchants. His family had five sons and three daughters, but it was Robert who would become the famous one in the modern era, because in the 1920s, it was revealed that this man, Robert Townsend, had also been Washington's spy with the name Culper Jr. This was realized because of handwriting analysis all the way in the 1920s. And so the museum might have always just told those stories, the story of a revolutionary spy, his patriot father, how the British quartered themselves in the house and made the house their headquarters, and how the Revolutionary War was played out in front of this family's experience. But then, 16 years ago, the phone rang, and that story really changed. It was an auction house in New York City called Swan Galleries. They were calling the museum to let us know that they had a Bible for sale, and they thought we were going to want to bid on it. Well, we already had several Bibles in our collection, so we weren't sure that that was true, but it was. This was a very special Bible. We bought it for $10,000. We would have paid almost anything for it because it had this record in the end papers, the names of enslaved people who had lived in the household of Samuel Townsend of Oyster Bay. And up until this point, we had been completely and utterly ignorant of the truth of slavery in New York. Like so many other people, even today, we just had no idea that it had even happened at all. And yet here were these names, Jeffrey, Catherine, Lily, Susanna, Harry, Susan, Rachel, Violet, Hannah, another Susanna, Mary Ann, Jane, and Gabriel. And the record also gave the day they were born or the year they were born and how they were related to each other, sons and daughters, husbands and wives. And then there was a second page with four more people, Nancy, Kate, Jim, and Josh. And this page really clearly stated 
that these were the slaves of Samuel Townsend of Oyster Bay. And so I worked very hard to understand what that Bible record meant. And then I worked to uncover other documents that shed even more light on the state of slavery in this household, because there were many other people who weren't in that record. John, William, Jacob, Priscilla, Amos Burling, and then two distinct records that didn't include names. So I call those two people the unnamed child and the unnamed man. But of all of the people I discovered, the most compelling story was the story of Elizabeth, whose nickname was Lys. Now, Lys would have never had her portrait painted, and this isn't a portrait from that era. I had a modern artist paint this painting for me. So it's just an artist interpretation, but I wanted to have something to focus on because her story is simply incredible. Ironically, there were twice as many enslaved people living in this household than there were towns and family members. So if our mission was to interpret the lives of the people who lived there, they now outnumbered the family two to one. And so the museum added another room and interpreted slaves quarters so that every visitor could really um, experience the difference between the conditions they would have lived in and the conditions that the other family members would have lived in. There's a very narrow steep staircase at the end of this room that you can't see in this photograph that leads down to where the colonial kitchen would have been. And that staircase combined with this poor roof line was why we chose this space. But we acknowledge that there's an attic up above where slaves probably lived. There's a dirt basement down below that would have also served as slaves quarters. And there were barns and outbuildings throughout this property where enslaved people probably also lived. And so in this revolutionary family story, we now had all these new members and their story was not in the Civil War. It was not uh, generations later. It was in the time of the revolution, in the time of America's founding. And so we wanna make space in that story for them. So in that founding era, the father of this household, Samuel Townsend, really stuck his neck out as a patriot because on Long Island, where he lived, most people were loyalists. So even though he was a town leader and a justice of the peace, his neighbors were not on his side. And he actually became a member of the New York Provincial Congress. They were planning the revolution from a New York perspective all the way through 75 and halfway into 76. And so they were having secret meetings and he and the other members were sworn to a solemn oath of secrecy to try to keep their plans literally from their neighbors. Then we declared our independence, right? No more secrets. But just one month later, Samuel was engaged in an amazing moment in time. He was hand delivering letters between Washington and one of the largest generals on Long Island, Brigadier General Nathaniel Woodhull. Woodhull was in Jamaica and there was a battle brewing in Brooklyn, but Woodhull couldn't enter that fight. He didn't have enough men. He desperately was begging for 500 more soldiers. Samuel was waiting for Washington's reply, which was pretty vague. Maybe he couldn't get him those soldiers, maybe he could. Several more letters were exchanged and Woodhull began to panic in these letters saying, I can hear them, I'm being surrounded. In the end, Washington gave Samuel Townsend a message that he wouldn't even write down on paper. He wanted Woodhull to get this important message. You're being abandoned. Washington had no choice. He had lost the Battle of Long Island. He had been vastly outnumbered by the British and tactically it had been a disaster. He'd been surrounded on three sides, but he was able to get his remaining army and himself off of Long Island and onto Manhattan due to a heavy fog that fell. But the battle was lost and General Woodhull had been horribly injured, injuries that would lead in several weeks to his death. And now Long Island, was completely lost to the British. And shortly thereafter, New York City was too. All of New York City became British headquarters and Long Island became literally a resting place for British regiments. We never got Long Island and New York City back. 
for seven long years. And so Oyster Bay became a place where regiments would come one after another to stay in our village. And in the fall of 1778, a regiment called the Queen's Rangers came. They would come two more times for a total of three visits. But this was the big visit going from the fall of 78 all the way to the spring of 79. And their commander, Colonel John Graves Simcoe, lived in our house and made the house itself his headquarters. You can see his regiment was dressed in green, not red. He didn't want his men wearing those red coats that he felt were like targets. He understood the value of camouflage. Now the room you're seeing in this picture is our parlor. Before the war, it was a nice fancy room to bring a visitor. But during the war, when the house was British headquarters, this was a room for a morning officers meeting or maybe an interrogation. Now Colonel Simcoe, as all of the different regiments that came and went in the house was considered by the family to be the most honorable. And one of the things that made him honorable was his belief that slavery was morally wrong. In fact, he had asked the British army if he could raise a regiment of escaped American slaves and command them in battle, but he wasn't permitted to do that. And then after the war, when he became the governor of Upper Canada, he actually put an end, a legal end to slavery in Canada in the 1790s, many, many years before New York ended slavery and decades before America ended slavery. So when you think about the Civil War era and American slaves going on the Underground Railroad to Canada, it's literally because of this man and how he had already ended slavery there. Now, in March of that wintering over year of 1779, he invited a very good friend to come and visit him and to stay in the house for several weeks. I know that you people know this guy, right? You're too into the Revolutionary War not to know about Major John Andre, who was not just a friend. He was the British spy master. So here's the room where Simcoe would have stayed and it's the room where Andre would have stayed too. Now in that room, they would have had Liss coming in and out as part of her duties as a household slave. She would have had much more contact with these men than any of the Townsend family daughters. She was described later on by Robert as being too fond of the British officers. I often wonder if Simcoe shared with her his anti-slavery beliefs. He may have been the first person in her life to really grant her genuine personhood and to give her the feeling that she might someday have her own freedom. Now, just as Simcoe and Andre are visiting the house, a spy ring is forming on Long Island and in Manhattan. Way out in Setauket, a man named Abraham Woodhull was traveling by horse all the way into Manhattan to visit someone he called a faithful friend to get intelligence from that man and others, bring that intelligence all the way out to Setauket, have these letters ferried across to Fairfield, Connecticut, and then eventually on to Washington. Now, I think that faithful friend actually was Robert Townsend, who was living and working in New York City. In fact, he rented a room from Woodhull's sister. Would have been pretty easy for Woodhull to go into the city on the excuse of visiting his sister, walk down the hallway, knock on Robert's door and get all the news. Robert, as a shopkeeper in Hanover Square, was in a particularly good place to pick up intelligence. He knew all of the ship's captains through his father's business, and he could walk right down to the dock and find out what was going on. Now, in the spring, Simcoe and his Queen's Rangers left Oyster Bay. They were gonna go up to the skirmishes and the the gathering of thousands of British troops that would take over Stony and Verplank's Point in a few weeks time. And as they left Oyster Bay with their regiment and their wagons, Simcoe allowed Liss to escape with them. Eight days later, Robert wrote a very interesting letter that we have in our collection about this escape. He tells his father, the Queen's Rangers are now beyond Kingsbridge. When I see any of the officers, we'll make inquiry for Liss. 
though I think there is no probability of your getting her again. Believe you should reckon her among your other dead losses. And then he pins the blame on Simcoe. He says, I'm surprised that Colonel Simcoe would permit her to go. He certainly must have known it when they left Oyster Bay. So let's break this down and think about what he's really saying. He's saying, I know where the Queen's Rangers are. Now they were traveling in secret as they gathered for this attack on Stony and Verplank's point. He knows right where they are. They're beyond Kingsbridge. Is he following behind them on a horse? He says that if he sees any of the officers, he'll ask them about this. He's that close to them. Then he tells his father he'll never get her back again. But why? He knows right where she is. And then he purposefully mentions Colonel Simcoe. It's a very curious letter. Soon after she escaped, she didn't stay with the Queen's Rangers. They were going to go on into battle. She went into Manhattan. Now, after the British took Stony and Verplank's point, Major Andre was there. He was the one that went into Stony Point uh, as they celebrated their victory. And then after that, he went right into Manhattan. I often wonder if he didn't help Liss go into Manhattan at that point. But she became re-enslaved by a British officer, a British officer whose name we don't know. Now, American slaves were being promised their freedom if they would come over to the British side, but not until the war was over. So she wasn't free yet. Now, right about the same time that Liss was coming into Manhattan to be re-enslaved by this officer, Robert was taking his place as head spy in New York City. That's because Abraham Woodhull, as he traveled from Setauga to Manhattan, was being stopped and questioned by British officers, and he was afraid. He was afraid he would get caught. And so he convinced Robert to become the lead spy in New York. Woodhull would stay out in Setauga and send a messenger in to get the letters. This is just a snippet of one of those letters, and it's just extraordinary, the sorts of things that it says. Robert writes, I have received your dictionary and will be glad to have the stain as soon as possible. When I shall endeavor to find some shorter route to forward my letters, he knew that the route around was way too long. He never could find that shorter route. But this over here is what he meant by the dictionary. Our spy master was a man named Benjamin Talmadge and he had created a list of important words and assigned them each a number. And then copies were made of this long list of words and numbers and given to all of the spies. He also talks about this, the stain. That was our invisible ink. We had our very own invisible ink technology that the British didn't know about. It had been invented by John Jay's brother, Sir James Jay, and it had two liquid parts. The liquid called the stain would completely disappear on clean white paper. And then another liquid called the counterpart would make it reappear. Not long after a list came to New York City and Robert became the lead spy, Abraham Woodhull used that culper code to talk about a woman, a lady, using the number 355. It was someone he had just become acquainted with. And he said this lady would have some way of outwitting them all. There's been a lot of conversation by historians about who 355 could have been, but considering the timing and considering the fact that an enslaved woman would be virtually invisible, I would like Liz to be put up at the top of the list of possible people who were the spy 355. Now, Robert had said in that letter earlier that his father ought to just never get her back again and just count off her value entirely. But Robert knew exactly where Liss was. I found several entries in his ledger over the course of the time when he was the spy, Culper Jr., where he bought her things. He bought her some tea. He bought her a thimble and some thread. So Robert had contact with Liss during the time when he was a spy. Now, in 1780 in the fall, the Benedict Arnold treason plot fell apart. John Andre was hanged as a spy by George Washington and Benedict Arnold came to Manhattan and started rounding up spies. Over 40 spies were arrested and many of them were people that worked closely with Robert Townsend. So he got out of town. He left town for about three months writing in a letter, I am happy to think that Arnold does not know my name. He moved to shop, which had been down in Hanover Square, sort of in the center of everything, 
when he came back three months later, all the way over to an area that's now called South Street Seaport, to a place called Peck Slip. After he came back to town in hiding from Benedict Arnold, he refused to write any more Culper Spy letters, even in invisible ink. He would only meet with Woodhull outside of town and give him audible reports. Then the end of the war came, and in 1782, many, many British started evacuating from New York City. They would continue evacuating until November of 1783. That included Liss's master. He was going to go up to Canada, and Liss did not want to go. She actually approached Robert and said to him, will you buy me back? I don't want to leave New York City. And Robert agreed, even though he had already begun to believe that slavery was wrong himself. He repurchased her and wrote his final spy letter, hand carrying it up to Westchester to deliver it to Benjamin Talmadge. There was another thing that he found out about Liz when she came to live with him. She was three months pregnant. He took her in, and in February of 1783, she gave birth to a boy. I believe his name was Harry. He describes this as a child which she had while with her then master, meaning himself. This is Robert's handwriting describing Harry as mulatto. So Harry had a white father. He never divulges who the father was. And I have to believe that it's at least a possibility that he was that father. Now, as I mentioned, Robert did not want to own a slave. In fact, he had an Irish housekeeper that kept his apartment clean. There was a woman that Liz knew named Anne Sharwin, who had recently become a widow, and she wanted to buy Liz and Harry, and Liz wanted to go and live with her. And so Robert arranged this sale, something he would deeply regret later on. But he made a special arrangement with this widow, Anne Sharwin. He said, I will sell Liz and baby Harry to you. Harry was about six months old at the time. But you have to promise me, if you ever want to leave New York, you have to let me know so that I can buy the two of them back again because they want to stay in New York City. She agreed. He handed them over and he thought everything was going to be followed. The agreement was going to be kept in place. But she was not a widow very long. And Sharwin got married within a year to a very wealthy merchant named Alexander Robertson. Now, this marriage was extremely short. Alexander Robertson behaved inappropriately in some way with Liss and caused a derangement and separation in this new marriage. And Sharwin virtually disappears from the records and somehow Alexander Robertson retained ownership of both Liss and baby Harry. And he immediately, either for spite or for the money, sold Elizabeth South to Charleston, South Carolina, and kept baby Harry in New York. You can only imagine that horrible, horrible day when her son was torn out of her hands and she was taken down to the docks of New York. She was transported by a horrible man named Captain Tinker. This man, Captain Tinker, and his brig, the Lucretia, were notorious for kidnapping free Blacks in New York. He would do this over and over again to such an extent that they began to put ads in the New York newspapers warning free Black people in New York that Captain Tinker was back in the harbor and that he might kidnap people if they weren't watching out. But of course, Liz was enslaved when she was loaded onto the Lucretia. So she was not technically kidnapped at all. She was just down in the hold with the other goods going down south, like these Burlington hams and the spruce beer. She was only considered property. Now, amazingly, on the very same day that she landed in Charleston, something else was happening in New York City there was the first meeting of a group called the Manumission Society, the New York Manumission Society. They were led by John Jay, and they had, as in their leadership, Alexander Hamilton, 
They even had another spy named Hercules Mulligan who joined and Robert Townsend. This group of New Yorkers wanted to end slavery by law immediately, but they failed. They could not get the votes. And so all of this is happening simultaneously. Now, the man who bought Liss down in Charleston, South Carolina, already had made a name for himself in the Revolutionary War way back in 1770. He, believe it or not, Richard Palms, was the instigator of the Boston Massacre of 1770. When you look at famous artwork of the Boston Massacre, you'll usually find a figure like this one, a man raising a club. That was Richard Palms. He struck one of the British soldiers with his club, and that's what made the bullets fly. A few years after that, he would become the personal bodyguard for John Adams. When John Adams crossed the Atlantic and went to France to help Benjamin Franklin negotiate with the French. And now you're gonna hear something that you're not even gonna believe because just as Richard Palms and John Adams are entering Paris to meet with Benjamin Franklin, Robert Townsend's big brother was there too. Solomon Townsend was meeting at the very same time in Paris with Benjamin Franklin, who wrote this for him, a certificate that stated that he was a, a United States of America patriot. It's a pledge of allegiance to the United States signed by Benjamin Franklin. Franklin only gave three of these oaths that are known of, and he was giving this one to Robert Townsend's own brother. Now, two years after Liss had been sold south, Robert found out and he was absolutely furious and in a panic. He went to Alexander Robertson's house, physically took Harry out of that household, brought him to Oyster Bay. Harry was now four years old and started frantically writing to these men in Charleston to try to get their help to bring Elizabeth back. Ironically, even though these men eventually did help bring Elizabeth back up to New York, they had to smuggle her back in because the New York Manumission Society had achieved one goal. They had created laws that prohibited slaves from crossing state lines into New York. But I believe that she did get back. I found a 1789 record from the Baptist Church in Oyster Bay where Samuel Townsend's name has a woman's name straight across from him, Elizabeth, a black woman. I believe that is our Elizabeth. His wife and daughter Sally are on a second page of that record. So if you've ever read about the Culper spy ring and the Townsends and you thought they were Quakers, it's not true. They were actually Baptists. I think I found her again the very next year in the first census in the United States, the 1790 census. I believe that this is her, free Elizabeth, working as a paid servant in the household of a man named David Richard Floyd Jones. Now, this wasn't just any old household. If you've ever heard the expression, keeping up with the Joneses, it's those Joneses. And this is what their house looked like. It was a beautiful mansion called Fort Neck House in a town that's now Massapequa. This is what the great room looked like, where Liss would have worked as a paid servant, um, helping with childcare and cleaning and cooking. There are even photographs of this grand house, which unfortunately burned to the ground in the 1950s, but we can still see the floating staircase and the beautiful arched doorways and imagine how Liss would have worked there at least for a time. Frankly, I don't know how long she worked there, because I lose sight of her after 1790. Liss didn't have a last name. If she married a man, she didn't appear in the next census because women's names just appeared as numbers in a column. Only the man's name would be listed as head of household. If she ever took a last name, I don't know what it was. And so I have to leave you hanging just as I'm left hanging. I keep hoping that as my book becomes more popular, someone will send me a new document so I can find out more about what happened to her after that. I do know this though, in 1827, after 201 years, slavery finally ended in New York. So I really hope you will learn more 
there's so much more in this book than just what I've had this short time to share with you today. Uh, these people's lives are important. Their story of slavery and the revolution deserves to have a figure like Elizabeth so that you can see the revolution through her eyes and you can begin to flesh out your imagination with the many African-Americans who lived here and who were part of that era. So this is where I'm gonna stop, but it's really where we're gonna begin because now we get to have a conversation together. We get to find out what you think of this new story, what you think of this new founding figure. And I'm gonna stop sharing so we can start that conversation. Great, thank you so much. Um, really wonderful to hear about um, Liz and her story. Um, I wanna start by um, inviting folks to submit their questions in the Q&A down at the bottom of your screen. Um, please submit your questions there, but I'll get us started with a question. Um, so you've shown us a lot of different types of resources and primary sources. Can you walk us through your research process? Um, how does one begin to try and find this story? You know, it was a 16 year process. And there were many times when I would hit a dead end and think that I would never find another crumb. And then miraculously, I would find one more thing. It really started with that slave Bible document, which fell out of the sky. This was from a descendant of the Townsend family. We had no idea that document existed. We really wish they would have just given it to us instead of make us pay for it at auction, actually. Um, and it was by trying to understand that Bible record that I reached out to institutions that had the papers of this family. Now, unfortunately, this Townsend family papers had been split up basically into three large chunks. Raynham Hall had a chunk. The New York Historical Society had a big bunch. And then the East Hampton Library had a large piece of the collection but it was vast. And then there were little tidbits in other places. So my method was pretty scattershot. If I knew an institution had any documents relating to that family, I would go there. Or related to Simcoe or Andre or Arnold, I would just go there and just read everything, photograph everything, and try to piece these puzzle pieces together. I think it's important to note too that Claire went in with, um sort of unprejudiced eyes, that she was willing to read these primary source documents um, almost anew and not necessarily take old or accumulated interpretations of them. Because for example, um, while the existence of someone named Liss was known from the letters, Claire, I think you should tell the story about what for years. Yeah, um, so Raynham Hall Museum owned this letter about her escape that Robert had penned and they recognized it as interesting because it had Robert's signature on it and it talked about Simcoe, so they were excited about that. But literally for decades, they believed that it was about the British stealing a cow. And the letter had a note on it. This is about them stealing a cow. It's like, what sort of um, whitewashing is going on here that this is what they thought? You know, it was just, you know, point of view. Like they just couldn't imagine that this would have happened. And they were still not understanding that the family was not Quaker. Not that Quakers can't own slaves. They do sometimes, they did sometimes, but they just had this mistaken belief about the family that just kept going for, for many decades. Um, and can you speak to um, how did the family get converted to the Patriot cause? Um, did it stem from the head of the Townsend family? What, what do we know about their rationale for participating in the Revolutionary War? You know, they, they came from a long line of civic leaders, going all the way back to these three Townsend brothers who came to Oyster Bay in 1661, literally on the run from Peter Stuyvesant of New Amsterdam. These three, two of these three brothers had signed a very important early American document that many scholars call a precursor to the Bill of Rights. This document has a lousy name. It's called the Flushing Remonstrance, but it's the earliest American document that states that individuals should have a right to worship as they please. 
And so these two Townsend brothers had signed on this document and Stuyvesant was coming after them for it. So they came to Oyster Bay because it was far enough away from Stuyvesant's reach and they settled there. And that tradition of civic responsibility carried through to the father, Samuel Townsend, who even before the Revolutionary War was standing up for the rights of groups like the French Acadians who were being persecuted. And so he as a wealthy business person also didn't like the trade restrictions and, and the different um, lack of representation. He was a representative himself of his community. And so when he joined that provincial Congress, he really identified himself as, a, as an outstanding patriot of his area. But of course, he was on the outs with most of the people in his town when he did that. Well, and those two um, sort of original Townsend brothers, two of the three, also signed something, another fascinating document that Claire uncovered in her research, which is this Oyster Bay bill uh, or sort of assertion of individual rights that they actually just published within their own town. And two of those three Townsend brothers had signed to that as well. So there really was an established tradition in the family of not only asserting um, the importance of individual rights, but of actually stepping up as civic leaders and saying this may not be popular, but we, you know, we put our names to this, we, we pledge ourselves to this belief. Yeah. Great. Um, so our next question, do you think Elizabeth's potential role as a spy is something that a lot of enslaved people may have done during the revolution? As people who were often overlooked or ignored, moving through houses as, a, as enslaved people. This comes from uh, Sheridan Small. You know, there are a couple of neat examples of this having happened other than Liz. Uh, you know, not that we can prove that it happened with her. But if you know about Hercules Mulligan, he was a tailor in New York City and his enslaved man Cato would be the one to carry the letters across enemy lines for him. And uh, there's another great instance in our book of uh, a man who Simcoe tried to help, well, he succeeded in freeing him from slavery down South. This man's name was Barney, he was a young man. And before uh, Simcoe started working to free Barney and make him part of the Queens Rangers company, Andre interrogated him for intelligence. And so Simcoe wrote to Andre and said, um, when, when you've gotten done speaking to Barney about any intelligence that he might know, uh, send him over to me because I'm gonna make him part of my regiment. Uh, Barney knew how to play the trumpet and he joined the regiment as a trumpeter. Uh, later on, he would perform so admirably in battle that Simcoe would bring him up to Canada after the war and get him a soldier's pension. So there's a couple different um, instances of enslaved people working to provide intelligence. Great. Um, several folks have asked if we know what happened to Lissa's son, Harry. Um, have you been able to find anything about him? I know that he came to live at the house, the Townsend home. And so while Liss was on the other side of the shore of Long Island on the South shore working in this household, he was too young to be freed. You were not allowed to be freed until you reached the age of 21 that time. And so he was living with his other relatives still enslaved in the Townsend household. But we, we can see in ledgers that after Samuel Townsend died in 1790, his son Robert took over charge of the estate and paid particular attention to Harry and gave him gifts of money on the holidays, um, particularly helped him learn a trade and created this document called um, Obligation to Manumit that assured that when he came of age, he would become free. But we don't know what happened to him after he became free because we literally don't know what his last name became or if he ever claimed a last name. And Harry, unfortunately, was a typical name. There were several enslaved people who were freed in the town named Harry. And even though there were many enslaved people that took the name Townsend, we, we have no way of knowing if they were enslaved by the Townsends or if they just wanted that name. You know what I mean? So with enslaved people, it's so hard to track them. And unless you have a, a way of solidly knowing what their last name became. All right, our next question um, comes from Laura and she asked, what was the writing relationship uh, between Miss Brooks and Miss Bellardrow? 
you could take that one, Tiffany. Okay. Um, so Claire and I actually met back in, I think, 2012. Um, I was working on um, doing some of the research and um, contributing writing for George Washington's Secret Six um, book about the culprit spy ring. And um, as part of that, uh, the team had gathered together a number of Long Island historians um, because there are a number of prominent historians who all work on different parts of the of the Culper spiring history. And we had this wonderful panel and talked to all these wonderful, brilliant historians. And that's where I met Claire for the first time. And she just, I mean, knocked everyone's socks off because she just has this <laughs> encyclopedic knowledge and passion about the Townsend family. Um, and so she and I stayed in touch. And then she reached out to me in December of 2015 and said, I've got this story that I've been researching for a number of years. And I, I, think, I think there's something here and I'd like to do something with this. And so uh, we started working together, um, working with her just phenomenal <laughs> research. Um, and she, you know, she would collect these notes and and find these fascinating uh, connections. And we talk things through and I take the information and craft a chapter and send it to her. And she'd look and say, you know, that's not quite right. Or actually, you know, it sort of happened this way because there's so many little intricacies and the level of detail that's available in these records is just phenomenal. Um, and so together we were able to craft this extremely complicated narrative. There are so many, um, rabbit trails that, you know, it was so tempting to chase. And some of them, you know, we do develop and some of them we have to say, oh, that's a good one, but we've got to let that go for the sake of the main story. Um, and so we really kind of developed the story. And one thing that we were very conscious of from the beginning was that where we didn't know, we wanted to be clear that we were speculating. Um, so there are a few, you know, because we don't, we didn't want to assert something as history that was just our, you know, our best guess. So there, there for example, when Liss leaves with the British, we lay out three possible scenarios of, you know, Simcoe knew, but Robert and Samuel didn't, you know, and what might that look like? And what might it look like? And so we actually, you know, we lay out and we let the reader choose, um, you know, which they think is the most likely scenario, because that's a hole in the story that we just don't know. And at this point can't know. Yeah, um, yeah. So it's a very collaborative process. But I also, uh, want to throw in uh, credit to one extra person who uh, was wonderful as a part of our team, um, who is Vanessa Williams. And she actually wrote the, uh, yes, that Vanessa Williams, that who Vanessa actually wrote the foreword to the book. Um, and Claire, if you want to explain how she yeah. came. Uh, actually, Vanessa Williams is, isn't just an advocate for this story. She's actually part of the story. Her ancestors are from Oyster Bay, where Liz was born. Um, and they can trace their family history back to the era of slavery. And so Vanessa's story is part of the story too. And I was able to meet her when she was dedicating a, a black cemetery in the town and tell her about Liz. And she really came aboard and she's been such an advocate for us, you know, to really represent the actual uh, history that is her family history that finds its way into this story. So very fortunate to have her support on this. Yeah. I saw in the chat that somebody asked, I know we can't get to every question, but somebody said, do you know where Liz was born? And we do have evidence that she was actually born and raised in that Townsend household. Um, we've had a few folks ask about fictional portrayals of the spy ring and um, also the American Revolution in popular culture, like Turn and the John, you know, John Adams miniseries. Um, as uh, public historians, as history communicators, can you share your opinion on those fictionalized accounts of history? I, I give a lot of public tours at Raynham Hall and a whole lot of people are excited to be there because of Turn. And so I have to be thankful for Turn. Mm -hmm. Turn has caught the imagination of a lot of people and, and got them passionately involved in the Revolutionary War. But unfortunately, they let the writers go to town. And the writers were not historians and they didn't value accuracy. And so there's just so many things that I have to break people's hearts. <laughs> you know, I, I have to let them down and say, you know, like Simcoe was not a murderous villain. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, the Queen's Rangers did not encamp in Setauket. And um, on and on and on. Um, and then they left such good stuff on the table. They didn't really focus on Simcoe and Andre's close relationship. And um, 
you know, all the interesting things that Simcoe did in Oyster Bay just got left behind. They also fell into the old uh, idea that the Townsends were Quakers. And they brought up this whole scheme that Robert worked with James Rivington, this newspaper man, that Rivington was a spy, that, that they had a tavern together. And ugh, just all these things are legends that have cropped up, but you just must look for the primary documents. And if you can't find them, you have to just set these ideas aside as legends. Uh, the big one on tur in turn is Anna Strong, that the woman Anna Strong in Setauket was a spy, that she was part of the ring and that she hung clothes on a clothesline to send a signal to the spies. That all sounds really fun and great, but there's no primary evidence that it ever happened. And it's actually not plausible if you understand how the spies did operate in ways that we can find evidence of. So I'm sorry, Turn fans, the whole Anna Strong story just needs to be set aside as a legend. On the one hand, it's sad to lose, you know, this strong, interesting female character who is a part of the revolutionary story. Like, you know, it's love to have, but there are, there's another amazing, you know, woman who is part of, you know, Amer of the American revolution, who's, a, you know, we can verify um, a good portion of her story. So that's, you know, it's sort of, you know, as, as painful it can be sometimes to, you know, tell people, you know, actually that that's not quite the way the story went. Um, it is exciting that there are alternatives who are real and verifiable and, um, you know, who, who, who we do have um, proof of, um, you know, of, of their involvement with some of these people and places. Even the historic marker outside of our museum at Raynham Hall has one of these legends in it. It has this untrue legend that the teenage daughter, Sally, who was the person who thwarted the Benedict Arnold treason plot. Nice try, Sally, but no, that wasn't you. <laughs> Um, so, uh, another one of our questions was, um, about Lissa's life in South Carolina or no, mm. excuse me. Yeah. No, Char Charleston. Yeah, um, Charleston. what do we know about her life and her experience there? What do the records say? Well, I was actually able to find, um, an ad in the paper that, that, um, Richard Palms, uh, placed. He was going to try to see if he could lease out the house where Liss lived down there with him. And so he describes it as this airy, commodious house outside of the gates. And um, if you know about Charleston's history, it was a walled city. So you really can't even get a, almost like a picture in your mind's eye of, of what that house looked like. Um, Richard Palms was quite a character. He mm -hmm. actually um, had all of his possessions stolen out of his house because he had cheated a man out of money that he was owed. So in retaliation, the man stole all of his possessions. And then they went to court over it. And in the court papers, you get a list of all of his possessions. So now you've got the props, right? First you had the house and now your mind gets to put all the furniture pieces in there and all the little goods that he owned. There was also just so many interesting records about these men who helped bring Liss back up, who lived in Charleston. Um, one of them, this man, Richard Lushington, so fascinating. He was a Quaker, um, a dedicated Quaker, but not a pacifist. He actually had been a captain in the Revolutionary War, and his company was comprised primarily of people of the Jewish faith, so much so that it was called the Jew Company, led by a Quaker. <laughs> like, okay, that's interesting. And uh, then there were even people down there who had lived originally in Oyster Bay and ended up in Charleston. So stories from the beginning of the book came full circle mm -hmm. as people who were part of her story down there. It was pretty incredible. The connections are just astonishing. One of the things I'd like to add is something that was so interesting working on this project was were the complexities that would emerge. Um, so like, for example, you know, at, with Lushington, as Claire mentioned him, that here we have a Quaker who's going against you know, supposed Quaker values, but then also leading, you know, a, a battalion of people of the Jewish, you know, I mean, it just, there was so much, um, again, complexity is really the word that, that I think comes to mind is that th th there was such a rich tapestry of all of these different identities and, and people who were part of America that maybe we don't always think of who really did touch this story in ways that felt so beautiful. 
um, because you really got a fuller portrait of what America looked like um, at the end of the 18th century and, and what the revolution really um, involved in terms of you know everybody having different parts to play in it. And the post-revolutionary war era too. Absolutely. And how America struggled to get back on her feet. Yeah. Great. Um, well, we have just a few minutes left. Um, I'm gonna ask kind of a challenging question. So Elizabeth is a fairly common name, at least in the modern era. Mm -hmm. um, how do we know that this Elizabeth is this Elizabeth is this Elizabeth? So um, some of the records I, I got lucky because she had an unusual nickname, Liz. Mm -hmm. Um, but there was a time early in my research when I wasn't sure if the Liss in the escape letter was the Elizabeth in the Charleston records. Uh -huh. But luckily, I was able to find on both sides of the ledger of the son and the father, the record where Robert paid his father back for Elizabeth and the father calls her Liss. It was like, whew. It was more challenging in the census record, the census of 1790. In the town of Oyster Bay, there were no other Elizabeths. And in Queens County, there was one other Elizabeth who was the wrong age and had multiple children. The other reason that, that gave a strong argument that that was Elizabeth was this family, David Richard Floyd Jones's family. It's very complicated and I hope you'll read the book because this Jones family was deeply connected to the Townsends. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of the idea of being a tainted, but if you were on the Loyalist side at the end of the Revolutionary War, you could be, be deemed legally dead in the eyes of America. And when you would be a tainted, all of your goods would be confiscated and sold and the profits would go to the government. And this Jones family was in real jeopardy of being, well, Thomas Jones was attainted. He had about 8,000 acres of land, what's now Jones Beach and Massapequa, and this enormous uh, mansion. And it would have been up for grabs and would have just been dissolved and, and sold off. But there was this one relative named David Richard Floyd who legally could inherit that land and that house, but only if he changed his name by law to Floyd Jones, and it had to be done in the New York legislature, and Samuel Townsend helped do that in the last few months of his life. So it's a long story, it's super complicated, but Samuel Townsend had a grudge against those Joneses that went all the way back to the 1750s when they had him imprisoned. And this was his big chance to get that, that land, which ironically had originally been Townsend land, and back, into Patriot hands because the Floyds, William Floyd, had been a signer of the Declaration. And then there's a few other Floyds. You'll have to read the book. It's complicated. <laughs> but um, there are, it, it's a tenuous tie to say that Elizabeth is her, but there is a supporting net of evidence. And we, tr we try to make that clear in the book. You know, what, like we said earlier, you know, when, when we're not sure, when we're working with the record, we work to make things as clear as possible, um, you know, to, to say this we can assert and this is speculative, but the, you know, the, the evidence seems to point towards this being what happened. You know, I hope she had that happy ending, even mm -hmm. though that wasn't the end of her life. I hope she ended up there. But even if that isn't her, it doesn't negate all the other things that happened to her, just mm -hmm. to not have that um, cherry on the top at the end. Um, I found that pretty late in my research. I'll never forget the day when I found that record that, that it could very possibly be her. Um, and even after the book was published, so last, about a week and a half ago, I found another piece of evidence that is another chink in the armor of that Floyd Jones story. And that, that documentation would have made the book, but <laughs> darn it, maybe in a reprint. Sounds I keep like finding things. So if anybody has any uh, any evidence to send my way, please do. Okay. Well, we are at eight o'clock here on the East Coast. So, um, well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for sharing um, the book with us. Um, and um, 
As, where can folks find the book? So we have a website. It's the title, espionageandenslavement.com. If you go to that URL and you go to the shop tab, you can order a signed copy. And so that's a great way to get a dedicated signed copy. But you can also go to Barnes and Noble, Amazon, and everywhere books are sold. It's out there. So Absolutely. either get it online or get a signed copy either way. 